Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What is the World Federalist Movement? What's the World Federalist Movement doing to promote peace, democracy, and environmental sustainability? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at an organization that focuses upon uh, promoting peace, democracy, and environmental sustainability, as well as dealing with many other thorny issues. My guest today is an expert on this organization. My guest today is Mr. William Pace. Bill Pace is the Executive Director of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. He has served as the convener of the Coalition for an International Criminal Court since its founding in 1995. Mr. Pace, a U.S. national, has been engaged in international justice, rule of law, environmental law, and human rights for the past 30 years. Bill Pace, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Well, happy to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. Bill, you've got a lot to cover here in <laughs> a very short time frame. Let's talk about the World Federalist Movement. When did it start? Why was it started? And what, was its, what is its major mission? Uh, the WFM is basically a one world rule of law peace movement. Uh, started in 1947 uh, by uh, veterans and very eminent uh, world leaders uh, uh, after World War II, which ended with uh, the United States dropping uh, atomic bombs on Japanese cities. And it was basically to try and help prevent World War III. To tr to create the structures for peace within the framework of the then new UN Charter uh, to prevent World War III. Mm -hmm. And I on your website, you have three basic concept areas there. We might just briefly mention them. One is international justice. What's an example of what are you doing in that area of international justice? Well, international justice is uh, kind of a centerpiece of the rule of law. Uh, we have uh, the World Court, we have the International Criminal Court, we have many now other important international tribunals, uh, regional organizations, the European Court for Human Rights, the European Court, and of course we have na uh, national courts. But uh, our international justice program is mostly dealing with uh, trying to make this new system of international criminal justice uh, uh, succeed and also to support the international Court of Justice, the World Court, in its work. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about that in just a few minutes along with the International Criminal Court, get into that. Another area is in the area of peace and conflict prevention. What, are, what is your emphasis there? Well, the, uh, the goal of the Charter was to prevent uh, the Third World War. And so peace has been a fundamental goal of, the, of our peace movement since, since the beginning. So what we need is to try and get the international community, one, to take the steps to prevent war. We need the United Nations to be able to prevent uh, uh, conflict. Uh, uh, what happens, unfortunately, is the UN primarily deals with catastrophic uh, conflict reaction. Uh, so it reacts to catastrophic situations. It doesn't prevent those catastrophic situations. That's not because of the UN, that's because of the member mm -hmm. states, and in particular, the Security Council, and in the Security Council, in particular, the five permanent members of the Security Council. So mm -hmm. our goal on peace is, is to really achieve the kind of disarmament that uh, would allow uh, peoples of this world to feel secure, to um, achieve the kind of international human rights laws, uh, 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 laws that will uh, deal with the protection of the environment, it would deal with the uh, financial uh, c 
catastrophe prevention, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what you mentioned has been a concern for years amongst UN people and what have you. Of course, the UN is not a supranational organization. It's not a one world government. It's not uh, super rich, that type of thing. But the early warning and early intervention have been concepts that have been debated and talked about. Uh, is there some way that uh, they could get more involved more quickly? Is it through the Security Council or is the current structure of the UN such that you may need another apparatus? Because so often countries wait until a po uh, problem has festered and just become intractable, then they say, well, we can't deal with it. Let's dump it on the doorstep of the United Nations. And the UN then has to try to get in and deal with it. And it's, in many cases, it's almost impossible. But no. in many cases, they do deal with it. Well, the, exactly. I mean, the, the issue is not so much early warning. It's early action. Mm -hmm. Intervention. Uh, yeah. uh, we don't have uh, action. Uh, we don't need military action mm -hmm. at the beginning. We need uh, peaceful settlements of disputes, enforcement of international laws. Uh, conflict uh, prevention. I mean, if you look at our system at the UN now, uh, compared to a local, say you have a fire, uh, you and I will call the fire department and the fire department will show up within a few minutes. At the UN, you have a fire, you have to go to the Security Council. And maybe after three months, they'll say, uh, okay, we'll, we'll hear about it. So there's a fire. Then they'll say, well, we condemn the fire. And they come back a few months later and they say, okay, we really condemn the fire. More neighborhoods are burning down. They come back another uh, several months later. Okay, now we're, we're, we're threatening to take action under Chapter 7 uh, on the fire. Months go by and then finally they decide, okay, well, we'll do something about the fire. Uh, then another meeting comes and then they say to the Secretary, Gen uh, Secretary General, okay, we're going to help put the fire out. Uh, you need to get some volunteer firemen, firewomen, volunteer fire trucks, and water. And this is an insane way to deal with fires. It would be completely uh, unacceptable at any other level than the international level. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is to get the rule of law to work so that there's automatic response to these catastrophes and we can help stop them at the earliest stages. Mm -hmm. And of course you've got the parts of the UN, you've got the humanitarian response with groups like the World Food Program, the UN Children's Fund, they're on the ground working full time, but on some of these other problems you mentioned, especially the ones that have political overtones with the Security Council and what have you, that has to have the strong support of the key member states, if not all 193 members of the United Nations General Assembly, but certainly key states in order to be successful. Now the third uh, item that you have is international democracy, and that uh, deals with not only uh, international democracy, global governance, but also UN reform. What What is your focus there? Well, our focus really is that uh, in the 70 years since the charter was agreed to, we've gone from literally a handful of governments that would it say be evaluated by Freedom House as full democracies uh, to now where over 100, 110 of the 193 governments are democracies. So democracy, uh, democracy, national democracy has been one of the main uh, forces of globalization of the last uh, 70 years. Mm -hmm. Ironically, some of the largest national democracies, the United States, the United Kingdom, India, are opponents of international democracy. They're in favor of hegemony in terms of governance at the international level. So we're trying to promote, basically you need to, uh, as, you, as the governments have done, say with the European Union, you need to apply the principles of constitutional democracy at all the levels of governance. And mm -hmm. it's uh, going to be a, a long, slow slog at the UN, but as I said, in 70 years, it's been a radical improvement and now the General Assembly is a majority of democracies, and I think those governments are much more in favor of international democracy than the most powerful governments are. Mm -hmm. And if our viewers would like more information on the World Federalist Movement, they can go to WFM uh, slash IGP.org. Right. <laughs> we'll get it out here in just a second and learn much more about what you're doing and the issues that we're talking about today. These are all very important issues. Uh, it is often said that the Secretary General, who's the, basically the CEO, a lot of people say is the CEO of the United Nations, is very powerful in some respects, in other respects it's not very powerful, but uh, there's, we've had eight Secretaries General, Ban Ki-moon currently is the Secretary General, there'll be a new one in 2017, I guess it is, January 1st, 2017, basically. 
that whole process is part of the UN. It's a very important process because the Secretary General is a very important key player, as we've seen with Ban Ki-moon. The climate change issue would not be where it is today. It would not have advanced as far as it is had not Ban Ki-moon been pushing this issue as one of his top three, if not the number one priority from the time he came into office mm -hmm. seven years ago. But the, the role of Secretary General is very powerful. In some respects, it's weak because you've got a board of directors of 193 countries. What are you, uh, your group uh, has a program to focus on the selection of the new Secretary General. Tell me about that. What is it about? Well, it's a good story. I mean, this is a, an example of what we're doing. We started literally 20 years ago in the run-up to the 50th anniversary of the UN in 1995. Uh, there were important proposals. The Cold War had ended, and uh, the Ford Foundation and uh, Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation and others had produced some major reports. And one of the very first things they indicated needed to change is how do we identify and select and appoint the Secretary General. Now finally, 20 years later, the General Assembly in September agreed to a resolution to reform the terrible process that has been used since 1946. Um, and so hopefully in the next uh, a few weeks we will see the General Assembly and the Security Council agree to a new procedure in which uh, nominees will be presented uh, to the President of the Council and the President of the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. Their qualifications will be circulated. There will be hearings in the Security Council, hearings in the General Assembly uh, with the candidates and, and that we will hopefully move to a merit-based, qualification-based consideration of who would be the best qualified person uh, to be Secretary General. Now, since 1946, there has been disagreement by the permanent members whether they wanted a chief executive officer or a chief mm -hmm. operating, a secretary or a general, and, and that has never gone away. In fact, while the U.S., Russia, and China disagree on almost everything in terms of maintaining peace and security, they desperately agree with each other on maintaining their veto and mm -hmm. trying to pick a secretary general that will uh, cater to their national uh, security interest and appoint their nationals to run the UN. That's been the procedure r crudely stated over the last uh, 69 years and hopefully the General Assembly will succeed in changing that for 2016. Mm -hmm. It's a very important position and it's one that needs the top <laughs> diplomat in the world or top CEO uh, to put it mildly because it's such an important position. The first Secretary General uh, Trig Lee, I guess, said to Dag Hammarskjöld, the second Secretary General, that being Secretary General is the most, quote, difficult job in the world, unquote. And, of course, that was because you had, the, as I mentioned, the Board of Directors of 193 countries and the General Assembly, so many of the intractable problems that are brought to the United Nations. Is it the most difficult job in the world? It is one of the most difficult jobs, I would suppose, being president of a major nation, uh, uh, there are a whole range of jobs heading the World Food Organization uh, program right now would be pretty challenging and uh, the humanitarian affairs is challenging. But if we can get the, the governments to adopt a merit-based, transparent, inclusive process for picking the most senior official in the international legal order, the Secretary General, then we can say now that's how all of the uh, highest appointments sh should be picked on the basis of transparency and qualification. Yes, you want to have a uh, regional diversity, gender uh, balance, etc. But mm -hmm. we want to have it be not who is the most politically acceptable person uh, to award this to for these votes or that exchange of uh, reciprocal agreement, but instead on merit and qualification. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would encourage our viewers to go to the website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com and take a look at some of the previous programs. Also, if you have suggestions for future topics and future guests, please let us know. Today we're taking a look at what can be done to promote international peace, democracy, and environmental sustainability, as well as deal with a whole myriad of other problems that are international but have local implications. I guess today is involved with an organization that's working quite, really quite diligently to focus on these problems. My guest today is Mr. William Pace. 
William Pace is the executive director of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. Bill, we're talking about this program, uh, or the selection process for the Secretary General. Again, a very important process. You have a program that you're undertaking, One for Seven Billion, is that what it is? Uh, what exactly is that? You have a website too, I think, one for seven billion dot org, is yeah. that correct? Well, we have a, a number of groups that participated with us in 2006 when we tried to change it last time, but we were too late to uh, affect the process. This time we started a uh, year and a half, two years ago, and we've come a long way because now the General Assembly has adopted a formal resolution. But it's about 800 NGOs working together. Uh, the SG is the uh, uh, Secretary General of the UN, which charter begins, We the People, so that's the one for seven billion. And we're calling for, as I said, a change in the, in the procedures. We also are calling for uh, the General Assembly to consider uh, the appointment instead of a five-year term that is renewable for another five years to a single term of seven years. This would give the Secretary General uh, much more independence because presently she or he, but it's always been a he, has to start campaigning uh, really within two years of getting the position to be reappointed. Uh, and that whole campaigning is full of reciprocal agreements that I think undermine the independence and the effectiveness of the Secretary General. So we're proposing one term for seven years and, mm -hmm. and try that out. It also would mean that the position would rotate much faster uh, ar around the, to other candidates or other regions around the world mm -hmm. over time. Uh, uh, we also would like to see the practice of the Secretary General having to promise to let uh, the five permanent members appoint nationals of their governments to run the UN without any transparency or vetting process to be changed. So we have a number of, of governance uh, improvements that we want to make in this appointment. And if we succeed here, as I said, it, it could be applied then to other positions under secretary generals in the UN. It could be applied to the World Bank, the IMF, other institutions that also have a very antiquated uh, processes for picking the heads of the organization. Mm -hmm. Now, the first eight secretaries general have been males. <laughs> we're aware of that. Uh, what would be the advantages of picking, uh, selecting a female to head up an organization such as the UN? Well, I, I mean, again, I think the, the uh, women are half of the planet, uh, are half of the human population. Uh, it's, uh, we failed so badly, the men, so let's, <laughs> we certainly sh should be willing to have uh, uh, women leadership on, uh, and global leadership, and we have extraordinarily highly qualified uh, uh, w women out there. So I just think that, again, the process has been part of this old boys club uh, global f uh, elite foreign policy uh, procedures, and that needs to change. And one of the ways we'll be able to hopefully reflect that is, is making certain that highly qualified women and men candidates are put forward for the 2016 appointment. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look back, the UN is celebrating its 70th birthday this year. We look back to 1945 when Franklin Roosevelt really was the key architect of creating the United Nations. The UN rose out of the ashes of World War II. It is an organization that dealt primarily with peace and security at the beginning, although it has some humanitarian aspects to it. But it is, there's been a grand canyon of change over the past 70 years in the United Nations. It's uh, taking on much more responsibility in dealing with the many of these problems. You've been talking about some of the reforms that could be implemented. Uh, are there others that the UN might look at as far as making it a more efficient organization, a more effective organization to help it move forward for the next 70 years? Well, as we're sitting here, uh, the 193 governments are in Paris trying to negotiate a, an agreement to address uh, uh, climate change, the protection of the world's biosphere, atmosphere. Uh, now, what we have at the global level, we have a United Nations, we have a World Trade Organization, a World uh, Bank, a World Health Organization, an International Labor Organization. Then we have, tucked away in Nairobi, a little voluntary-based UN environment program. Mm -hmm. So one issue, I think, in terms of global governance is that the United, the international community needs to upgrade environmental protection so that it is not a, just a voluntary funded program, but an, an international environment organization that can enforce and implement international, multilateral, international environmental 
agreements and treaties. And one of the weaknesses that will come out of Paris is that the climate change will be built on a foundation of pledges of national governments, but the mechanisms for actually enforcing and implementing uh, how those pledges will be realized really is going to be also based on a voluntary case-by-case, uh, donor-to-donee -case, donor basis. And we would like to see it much more governance. We'd like to see that's protect the global environment. And interestingly, the sooner the international community develops uh, institutions, mm -hmm. say, on gl global environmental protection or uh, global uh, finance uh, regulation, the less will be the uh, uh, the structures, uh, the less uh, onerous. The longer we wait, the more uh, uh, invasive will be the governance bodies. So uh, we're already probably 40 years uh, behind on, on this, but we ought to move forward on some of these democratic glo global governance uh, rule of law issues as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And of course, we look at this climate change issue, the window is closing very quickly. The problem is being exacerbated every day. We see the glaciers melting, the seas rising, desertification taking place, and the problem is not going to get any better. And <laughs> we've got to deal with it, and we have to deal with it very quickly, and it's everybody has a role to play. But before we run out of time, I want to mention another group, another organization. The UN does not control today, but it helped create it, the International Criminal Court. And that was a very important body that came online fairly quickly after it got rolling. Uh, it, in the UN, it takes many years so often for a program to get moving. Basically, what is the International Criminal Court, and what is its main mission? Mission. Okay. Well, again, this was a, a project that we had been working on as an old peace movement for 35, 40 years, and then finally, in 1994, the General Assembly produced a draft statute for an international criminal court. Uh, we created an NGO coalition to support uh, the, the treaty negotiations that led to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. It's a new permanent world court holding for, uh, with the jurisdiction of individual responsibility for those who commit the worst crimes in international law, that is war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. So whereas the International Court of Justice uh, deals with uh, uh, disputes between nation states on a voluntary basis, the ICC actually has transnational uh, authority that s nations that have ratified, or governments that have ratified the treaty have given it, to hold any individual, no matter who they are, what their position is, who commits these crimes by their nationals or on their territories. And now we have 123 of the 193 nations that have ratified the Rome Statute. And as you said, it was expected, one, it would take decades to ratify, and it was ratified by 60 countries in three years and eight months. And then it was going to take decades before it would have any cases uh, uh, to deal with. And, and now it is just, it's overloaded uh, with cases. And governments that we, we hadn't predicted, but governments actually are asking the court to come in and conduct investigations and prosecutions for crimes that occurred in their own uh, territories, and that's the primary source of all of the cases at this point. Mm -hmm. And one of the countries that's not participating in the International Criminal Court right now is the United States, and the U.S. has argued that uh, they were afraid that rank-and-file soldiers or military people might be taken before uh, an ICC tribunal, but with this uh, com uh, complementarity, I guess is the, the legal term, uh, yeah. what exactly is complementarity and why is that well, not a very substantive well, argument. Uh, it's an incredible treaty, the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, and I, we don't have time to go through all of the uh, key elements, but one of them is that national legal systems remain primarily responsible. They're the ones who should be investigating and prosecuting these crimes at the national level. Or sometimes perhaps a, a, a regional system will come in in, in the not-too-distant future to to help uh, do it. So the complementarity is that it should be the primary responsibility of national laws and institutions, but when they're unable or unwilling, then the International Criminal Court uh, is, has jurisdiction. So when you've ratified this treaty, you have uh, integrated this court into your national uh, legal system, which is, which is uh, extraordinary. And, mm -hmm. and the U.S., I mean, the, the truth is the U.S. wanted the court if it can control it and make sure that it never applied to them. 
that would, that would be the position of Russia and China and India and some other countries. So instead, the, the small and middle power democracy said, no, let's create a court that would be fair and independent, and it will apply only to our nationals and to crimes on our territories, unless the Security Council, under its extraordinary Chapter 7 powers of peace and security, refers a matter. And again, twice the Security Council, even with the U.S., Russia, and China opposing the court, has referred uh, situations uh, uh, to, the, to the ICC. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the last two years of the Bush administration, that they actually tried to kill the court the first six years of the Bush administration. In the last two years, they began quietly cooperating. And the, Bu and the Obama administration has been mostly cooperating with the court. Okay. Well, Bill Pace with the World Federalist Movement, these are very important issues. They're very, they affect all of our lives, and we need to learn much more about them and get involved in combating these problems as we see them, like climate change and many others. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.